Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this panel conversation about the, the question of modernity. Um, uh, the title of the, of the panel is Overcoming Modernity, Being Overcome by Modernity. There is a cl uh, clear dis uh, connection with uh, a kind of uh, discussion uh, that uh, was done in the 40s in Japan um, about this subject that uh, will be somehow addressed in, uh, during our, uh, our panel. Um, the subtitle is Towards Critical Denaturalization of Normative Paradigms and Academic Disciplinarity in Japanese Studies. Um, my name is Matteo Cestari. I'm from the University of Turin in Italy, and I teach uh, East Asian religions and philosophies um, and other things as well. So uh, my uh, uh, presentation here, uh, now I, I start taking my, my time. Uh, I'm going to share now uh, my presentation. It uh, has a quite a slightly different uh, um, title from what uh, I uh, planned before. Um, uh, here you see Japanese traditions and theories of modernity, a global approach. I chose to uh, change post-colonial with global because I think it's a more global in the, in the sense. And uh, the, the question of tradition, traditions, uh, as you certainly know, is a quite an important issue for uh, modernity problem and is extremely important in Japan, uh, especially for the construction of Japanese self-image. So uh, what I'm going to do uh, here, you find uh, the orientation, is uh, to deal with the problem of modernity, to understand what is this problem, uh, how it was uh, traditionally addressed. Um, and I find that there, there are at least two ways of defining it as a rupture or as a, a system. Uh, I will try to discuss a bit how Japanese modernity has been dealt with uh, both in Japan and outside Japan. Then I will turn to the uh, brief debate uh, about uh, the, the term traditions. And I finally will give you two alternative approaches to the question of modernity, one by uh, the sociologist Nikos Muzelis and the other one by uh, Goran Therborn. So now we are going to start with the problem of modernity and uh, saying that uh, the que this question is quite a difficult, a long disputed one. And it is quite a complicated uh, one because uh, of the fact that it is not purely theoretical. Uh, it has to do with the representation of history and so um, ideology, power, etc. But also with uh, questions that have to do with sociological, anthropological and historical facts, phenomena. So uh, uh, this makes um, the, this, uh, pr this point extremely uh, tricky to, to define. And uh, for example, if we uh, define modernity as a question, as a problem of universal, and for example, saying, uh, trying to uh, discuss about a general definition that can be considered as mostly apt to define humankind in a way that may include all people in the world, actually this uh, universal claim clashes against the fact that it has very specific origins and very specific evolution and was used in a very specific way. From this perspective, what um, you see here in um, um, uh, is uh, what uh, Stroth and Wagner uh, define as a kind of hasty interpretation of modernity. So commonly we think that modernity is a European endogenous process. And this makes Europe as a kind of pulsating heart of modernity in 18th, 19th and 20th century. But actually this is not as what we should actually think. Modernity, they say, is less European and Europe is less modern than we have for too long been used to thinking. And here I'm going to address one or probably three 
elephants in the room. Uh, these elephants in the room are actually the fact that, uh, for example, the relative European mastery on the world uh, in the 19th century could be possible because of the consequences positive to Europe, but negative to almost all other continents of the triangular com commerce, which included slave uh, system in the American colonies and the development of the racist ideologies. So Europe took uh, advantage in a very violent way of African labor force and of American soil, causing directly or indirectly deaths in the million. Uh, um, the relative peace, the second elephant, the relative peace in Europe at the end of the 19th century was mainly due to the exportation of conflicts in colonial zones. And as a third uh, extremely important point, um, Europe was not as modern as we think. Um, so um, the, the, the image of modernity as the sum of democracy, industrialization, scientific knowledge, individualism, in other words, the mastery of non-human world and the autonomy of human beings comes quite later, later much later than the 19th century. century. Um, we could say, uh, together with Stroth and Wagner, that um, it was a particular history that was conflated with the analytical and normative theorization of society and politics. So uh, how has, be, how has uh, modernity been defined in a traditional way of thinking, the tradition of thought? We have two orientations. One, the glorious one that comes from Hegel, Marx, Weber, Habermas, consider uh, modernity as a rupture, as a dramatic change, as a revolution. The other one, from Emil Durkheim, uh, Parsons, and Luhmann, as a differentiated, highly organic system. We start with modernity as a rupture. Uh, from this perspective, we say, we see that. Um, uh, modernity is considered as a kind of radical change in the historical and cultural patterns of thought and behavior. Here we find, for example, Habermas's position that uh, interprets Hegel's idea of modernity as a movement from the old to the new. Uh, modernity in uh, one possibility of saying modernity in German, of course, is Neuzeit. And so we find this one here and this other uh, position by Habermas, the modern world is distinguished from the old by the fact that it opens itself to the future. So uh, in this context of modernity, we uh, think we, we, we include also the idea of progress. So on one hand, we find modernity as the new era, the idea of progress, of advancement, of universality, innovation, uh, knowledge, science, etc. On the other hand, we find that the past, as opposed to modernity, is old, is a place of regress and stagnation, backwardness, uh, particularity, and you see tradition. Actually, there is another way of, uh, um, sorry, I, I skipped uh, something that I was not meant to. Uh, modernity uh, can be also considered as a differentiated system. Uh, in, uh, in this context, tradition is more as a social, considered as a social function. This is the tradition that starts from uh, Emil Durkheim, that uh, uh, in whose perspective, the division of the work and the differentiation of social functions in uh, a modern society become fundamental in order to develop a kind of social solidarity that unifies the members of society because a highly specialized individual is closer to society somehow than a totally independent one that is able to do anything by him or herself. Talcott Parson developed uh, these ideas into a scheme of social uh, functions and structures uh, defined according to four um, functions or four structures. This is summarized in the 
AGIL scheme. Uh, AGIL is an acronym for adaptation, goal attainment, integration, and latency. And adaptation is the function of interacting with the environment that includes gathering resources and production or, and the production of commodities. Uh, goal attainment uh, has to do with the uh, uh, political life of a society. Integration has to do <clears throat> with the uh, um, function of harmonization of the entire society through the, uh, the values and the norms of, of that society. In, in this context, we have religious systems and medias. And finally, we find latency. Uh, latency as the, 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 the function that uh, <clears throat> passes uh, the belief systems from one generation to another. Um, so uh, traditions belong in this context, in this uh, pattern, uh, to the I uh, function or the L function, so the integration or latency. In both cases, uh, they are far from being juxtaposed to modern social functions. On the contrary, they appear to have a specific and quite important function, that of integrating individuals within society and providing social stability. Now we pass, we go on uh, to discuss uh, how Japanese modernity has been dealt with. We find uh, the first case, probably the first case of, uh, of Japanese modernity before 1945 in the Meiji Japan, uh, as you probably all know, <clears throat> the positions of Meirok Sha and Fukuzawa Yukichi in particular, was that Japan needed to become a modern country like Europe. And so a lot of traditions needed to be evaluated, critically confronted compared to European ones, and some brave choices, that is changes had to be made. So Japan had to be in that period um, had to avoid being colonized by imperialist Western countries, and therefore it had to, be, to westernize itself and to prove to be able to be a civilized country. Compared to this position, um, the idea, the position of the overcoming modernity debate in the early uh, 40s uh, is quite a different one. Uh, you see, this uh, Kindai no Chokoku debate uh, was developed mainly by the Kyoto School philosophers. You can, you are, uh, you see listed here. And uh, what has been done by them in this debate was a kind of counter geographization or alternative alternative geographization of the modernist European narrative. On one hand, we find European countries that define themselves as modern in juxtaposition to the rest of the world. On the other hand, we find the Kyoto School philosophers who started from the idea that Japan had to get rid of modernity as the West, so modernity identified with the West, and overcome these limits uh, of the West as modernity, going back to the Japanese way in which an allegedly ancient but actually invented traditions, such as samurai ethics, EA system, sacrifice of the individual for the state's sakes and, and, and the like, play a fundamental role. This uh, may have led to uh, free Asia from Western expansionism and bring all Asian countries back to the true cultural origins, opening a new era of pluralism. This, of course, was a, a, a kind of purely imperialist propaganda, or at best, a philosophical embellishment of what was the, the, the imperialism and colonialism of, uh, of Japan at the time, that of Daito Akio Eken, the great Asia co-prosperity sphere. What is particularly important here, however, from the global approach to modernity, is that these philosophers identified themselves uh, too quick, sorry, identified too quickly modernity with the West and consider Japanese modernity as only a phase through which their country had to pass in order to understand the limitations of the West. Uh, so they uh, affirmed that through such an experience, Japan had already overcome modernity and in the process, the, uh, Japan had become the most suitable country 
for leading non-Western countries to new, a new world order. Um, ironically enough, this uh, way of thinking is clearly dependent on the Hegelian idea of Aufhebung. So it's quite a, quite a strange position uh, if we consider it from a traditionalist uh, uh, Japanese approach. Uh, after uh, 1945, after Second World War, we find two other positions that are worth interesting, uh, worth uh, um, uh, good looking. And the, the first one is Maruyama Masao's idea of ancient substratum uh, that is a kind of layer transcending particular historical epochs, which continues to have an effect, a moment that modifies the foreign universalist worldviews that Japan has received since ancient times and which prevents Japan from being fully modernized. Uh, another, of course, very different perspective is the idea that we find in some Japanese uh, Marxists, uh, namely uh, Yamada Moritaro or the Koza branch of Japanese Marxism, uh, who in uh, uh, his debate, in their debate uh, about Japanese capitalism insisted that Japan was not an entirely modern country and remnants of feudalism were still strong. So they uh, quite interestingly ended with proposing that capitalism in Japan, as well as in other parts of the world, and we find here something a bit different from the, the general scheme of uh, the, 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 the interpretation so far, was structurally allied with feudal remnants. However, we can see uh, that mainly speaking, uh, all these uh, modernization, uh, modernity models we have found, uh, so we have seen so far, uh, be belong to a kind of convergent model of modernity. So the idea that uh, all uh, traditions, all countries in order to be moder modern must go and converge to one modernity. And this modernity, of course, is that of Europe, be it something that we have to uh, refuse or something that we have to accept. There is a different perspective of modernity, quite a famous one, actually, that of the so-called multiple modernities theory uh, by, um, you see here, uh, Samuel Eisen Eisenstadt and uh, Robert Bella, uh, who um, graphically could be defined in the way you see here on the, on the presentation. So a, a certain tradition, a certain civilization gives rise to a certain modernization. A different tradition, different civilization implies a different modernization. This means, however, that uh, we, um, if, uh, we pass, we move from, we replace the universalism implied in the Eurocentric modernity um, with a kind of particularism based on cultural and especially religious motifs. And traditions, religious traditions in particular, are hypothesized to the point that there is no particular, uh, there is one particular modernity for each country. You see uh, here one a phrase by uh, Robert Bella. Um, the Japanese thinkers have used the materials of an axial tradition to justify a non-axial position. So using the axial to overcome the axial, just as some thinkers early in the modern World War II sought to overcome the modern. So you can see the relationship with the previous ways of looking at Japanese modernity that appear quite clear. Uh, just to just as a, a brief uh, explanation of what actual means, uh, actual age uh, is a Carl Jaspers idea that uh, says that between eighth and thirty and third century before Common Era, uh, new religious and philosophical ideas look new religious philosophical ideas developed all, all around the world, and uh, this created a kind of axis of uh, complete change uh, in the course of humanity something that many uh, define as a baggy monster, which tries to bundle up all sorts of diversities. Anyway, um, we go on in uh, discussing um, the question of um, tradition. Uh, 
um, especially uh, referring to the, the, the commonly spread ideas about traditions, we can consider uh, tradition uh, as a temporal framework that predates modernity in this sense, uh, compared to the institutionalized doubt of modernity, according to Giddens, a tradition represents the ontological security of a previous society, or a tradition can be considered as a kind of continuous cultural transmission, which although coming from the past, still remains vital in the present. Unfortunately, both these ideas of tradition are non-historical, are ahistorical. As uh, Hobbes, Gold, and Ranger say, traditions which appear or claim to be old are often quite recent in origin and sometimes invented. As you know, this idea has been also quite, uh, quite important in Japan too. Invented traditions uh, in Japan was um, uh, an, an, an important uh, volume by Vlastos in 1998. Uh, in this volume, uh, we find the idea that tradition, at least when opposed to modernity, is a modern trope, uh, is a prescription, prescriptive representation of institutions, ideas, and practices considered to have been transmitted from generation to generation that has a rhetorical and also a practical bodily meaning whose aim is to strengthen the bond between fellow citizens. Apart from some caveats that we, of course, have to consider when dealing with the, the, the question of invented traditions, such as a, the all too stiff just a position between invented and true traditions, the top down tradition versus bottom up customs, etc., or the unchangeability of traditions, which is quite a problem. But anyway, uh, something can be said about it. Can we say, starting from this idea, that modernity is something that is opposed to traditions? Or are not, these, are not there some common traits both to modernity and to pre-modern periods? This may imply to discuss about the question of ideology modernity. So why is that that modernity needs to present itself as something that is completely different from what happened before. Or we can say, is there any specific modern trait that is not something that passes through this juxtaposition? We may discuss about capitalism, scientific knowledge, or maybe technological advancement, a certain level of technological advancement, of course, and uh, political and cultural strong identities, of course, but uh, how can we connect it with the, the problem of uh, traditions? This is quite a, a big question. I'm not going to uh, too deep. Um, so I'm going to skip a bit and go to Muzeli's uh, alternative approach to modernity, which I find quite interesting because uh, he is trying to develop a non-Eurocentric or non-ethnocentric idea of modernity, which is still somehow not conscious enough of uh, the, uh, the weight of colonialism in the development of modernity, but which still has something to say, because for example, it avoids convergent modernity, it avoids the Parsons harmony effect that occurs when we deal with, uh, with Parsons' agile scheme, and he tries uh, quite intelligently to move from dualism to a kind of gradualism in discussing social functions, even if his approach is clearly more focused on institutions. Uh, for example, on the context of the discourse about conflict and harmony in Europe and Japan, uh, we find that Muzelis is underlying the clash between different discourses, different uh, social functions inside society. For example, in Europe, we find uh, this uh, interesting catch. Uh, the logic of the market in Europe prevailed over the logic of the non-formalistic democracy in political sphere, over the logic of solidarity in the social sphere, 
and over the logic of motivation producing cultural autonomy in the latency sphere. So uh, this uh, he uh, brings uh, the, the, the particularly the, the, uh, the example of uh, Thatcher government in Great Britain. But also in Japan, we know that in Japan, the question of harmony is particularly important. And he says that Japanese modernity is effective in combining uh, different uh, functions, but at the expense of the effective democratic representation and political pluralism. He defines uh, uh, Japanese modernity as a kind of mild authoritarianism. So uh, as far as the last uh, part of, our, of my uh, presentation is concerned, we move to Thurborn's alternative approach to modernity, which I find quite interesting because uh, uh, Thurborn is more linked to the idea of uh, modernity as a change, as a rupture, but actually he is moving uh, much uh, beyond this idea, uh, considering modernity as a time orientation concept um, that, that needs to be focused on global connections and coexistence between different historical modernities, especially looking at uh, two types of imbrications, the entanglement between modernity and traditions and the uh, geo-historical entanglements. For example, on the question of modernity traditions, he says he recalls the cultural phenomenon of modernism as something that was never meant as a break with the past. And also uh, he recalls that the empirical history uh, of modernity is not linear. For example, he says, even if Great Britain is a modern country, we find monarchy, uh, and British monarchy uh, placed at the center of it. Or in France, we find second empire, or in, Amer in American history, we find slavery and institutionalized racism. I'm not sure that uh, uh, he has focused a tradition in the way I have explained before. I have some doubts in it. Anyway, his idea of looking at modernity tradition is quite interesting because he tries to combine uh, the idea of modernity and uh, modernity and um, and tradition and, uh, and and tradition with uh, geo historical definitions. So uh, you see here the past. If the past was inside our society until now, the future and the future will be in our revolution or in our evolution. We are in Europe. If the future is in uh, is in catching up with others, we are in a colonial zone. So you see, we can, you can define where we are. Uh, so the geo-historical um, situation of, of a specific country, starting from the way in which the past and the future has been defined uh, accordingly. And for example, Meiji Japan is defined here as a successful reactive modernization. Finally, I'm going to discuss a bit on this entangled modernities uh, scheme, which I find particularly telling, because uh, even graphically, you can see that there is a very much uh, big difference between this approach and the convergent model or uh, the uh, multiple modernities model. Here you see uh, Thurborn's original model. You see that there are many traditions, but also many modernities. And these traditions and these modernities have a lot of imbrications among themselves. What I would like to do, however, is to try to revise this position with something more conscious about tradition. So for example, it is not that tradition number one gives rise to a modernity number one, but also that modernity number one identi uh, um, uh, influenced tradition number one as well. And also that uh, different modernities have relationship with the tradition, with the, with the first modernity. And also the fact that different traditions have different, have many implications among them. Uh, 
you find here uh, the bibliography of uh, that I used uh, in order to uh, prepare my uh, my presentation. And I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, but no time, please write me at this email address. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we can move uh, to, uh, thank you, Matteo, to Tsumi-san's. And I remind uh, our, our uh, 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 persons who have come to, to join us that all, we will take the questions at the end of all three presentations, all three talks. So, Utsumi-san, please go with your present talk. Okay. Uh... Thank you for coming. So I'm uh, here from Utsumi, uh, working at uh, Kaposta University of Venice uh, since last year. Uh, I'm a sociologist, uh, especially social theory is my specialty, or a social theory. Uh, my, pre the, my presentation is Modernity, Globalization, and the Experience of Japanese Society. Uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, the streams. Uh, this panel uh, intend to critically discuss the great, great divide between humanity and uh, humanities, social sciences, and area studies, including Japanese studies. So, uh, for discussing this problem, uh, we uh, we are critically uh, discuss about the assumption concerning uh, modernity. The, in this, uh, in my presentation, I'd like to reconsider an approach to modernity and globalization based on the experience of Japanese society. Uh, it is a very, uh, very uh, small step for theorizing modernity and globalization and uh, overcoming uh, uh, the great divide. So, Grow, uh, number two, globalization has become, the world globalization has become a term to describe a trend in social uh, changes since the 1990s. The main future of contemporary societies emphasized by it is that the transborder mobilities of people, goods, money, and information have strongly affected social life worldwide. And they, uh, as a result, uh, the, uh, it is crucial that the transborder mobilities are not temporal but institutionalized. And as a result, they constantly affected people's social life. Uh, with the spread of the concept, countless researches on globalization have appeared. However, we can ask once more, is it recent that the trans uh, transborder mobilities have come to influence people's social lives seriously? At least related to Japan, the answer is no. Uh, the social life of people in living in Japan has repeatedly experienced globalization in, in such meanings, uh, globalization. Uh, for example, the latter half of the 19th century was one of the most remarkable periods of globalization. And uh, there are a lot of researches. Uh, I pick up uh, only two uh, researches, Nakaoka Tetsuro and Andrew uh, Gordon. Uh, it is empirically uh, well known that globalization is not a new phenomenon to Japan if it means institutionalized transport and mobilities that affect people's social life. However, uh, the theoretical implications of this 
have not been fully explored. One of them fully explored it is a uh, sociologist called Lorske. Koto uh, says, uh, globalization. Koto uh, uh, says that uh, the uh, cognitive mutual of social sciences, which prefers to explain social changes in terms of internal factors within society. Uh, uh, this is a problem. Uh, uh, so the social sciences uh, have this kind of nature and uh, this blocked to recognize uh, the Japanese experiences. As, as a representative of endogenous development theory is a modernization theory, uh, which became popular in the mid 20th century. And Based on this uh, theoretical framework, the endogenous development of modern social and Japan has been regarded as an exceptional modernization and uh, positioned as a peripheral event of little theoretical value. Uh, according to Koto, uh, contrary to the, uh, the general assumption of modernization theory, endogenous uh, exogenous modernization in Japan is not an exceptional phenomenon. So what, uh, what uh, Koto says, what characterized modernity was a high degree of transfer, uh, transferability, and then the exogenous development is also an essential type of modernization. Uh, Koto describes the uh, transfer of Western modernity to the non-Western world uh, as follows. Firstly, the modernity to be cut out uh, as a unit of transfer, a module, he described, he says, is determined in the inter interaction between the Western countries and the non-Western countries. Moreover, the transferred uh, modernity or module is not settled in the non-Western world as it is. The emergent restructuring uh, of both modernity and tradition in the, in the interaction allows modules of modernity to operate smoothly in different contexts. Uh, Koto calls the transforming and transferring process of modernity this kind of transferring modern process of modernity, hybridization. Uh, Koto names modern social change based on the uh, transfer modernity as hybrid modernity. And he positions the uh, modern Japanese experience as a typical case of hybrid modernity. Uh, Koto theorizes the modern Japanese experience as a standard version, a kind of standard version of modern social changes, not exceptional with the low theoretical value. So according to the theory of a uh, hybrid modernity, global, the contemporary globalization is a contemporary uh, is a de development of modernity in which exogenous hybrid modernity overwhelms endogenous development on, on a worldwide scale. However, uh, however, uh, is globalization new to the West? Of course not. Not only to Japan, uh, uh, for Japan, uh, but also with for West. Uh, is globalization is not new. Uh, in the st study of history, for example, the perspective that approaches history in terms of entangled, interconnected, and non Eurocentric development is known recently as global history. There are ki uh, such kind of uh, research, uh, there are a lot of such kind of research. Uh, 
Much uh, research uh, categorized that global history has been published one after another, and it shows that globalization is not new to Western countries too. And furthermore, even so-called modernity, often regarded as one of the most important results of the endogenous development in the West, began to be seen as nothing more than uh, products of transborder interaction. And for, for example, Christopher Bailey studies the modern West from endogenous development, ex exogenous, exogenous development. And Bailey points out that Western modernity has its origin outside the West. And also the West for a while was an exemplar and controller of modernity. In the mid 19th century, several new exemplars and controllers of, of modernity emerged around the world, including Japan. So, uh, if globalization is not a new phenomenon, not only for Japan, but also uh, for the West, then what are features of contemporary globalization compared to with previous globalization? Uh, it is possible to define contemporary globalization from viewpoints of, for example, scale, speed, and means, of course. For example, a internet computer network and a speed of modernity and scales of uh, mobilities. Of course, uh, these are uh, the characteristic of contemporary modern globalization. But in addition to this, I'd like to see that a defining future of contemporary globalization is the prevalence of the word globalization. A different from the past, in contemporary globalization, a myriad of actors, individuals, associations, companies, states, and international organizations, and so on, on the planet, have come to see themselves as living in the age of globalization, and have been destructed based on such kind of awareness, have been restructuring the tradition and the modern in their own way. Uh, with aspirations, uh, for example, aspirations with aspirations and anxieties and frustrations such as wanting, wanting to be ahead of the time, not being le uh, left behind, and believing globalization is wrong. And such kind of people's awareness that they are living in the age of globalization is driving the dynamics of contemporary globalization or hybridization. It seems for me uh, one of the most apparent features of contemporary globalization. Uh, at this moment, but at this moment, I'm not going to sell rights and uh, globalization of modernity uh, more thoroughly. And I think well, without ex, uh, exper uh, experiential researches, uh, without experiential researches, uh, uh, theorizing modernity or globalization is not meaningless. It's many meaningless. Now, now I have just started a more empirical study on Japan in the age of globalization. Uh, in this research, I'm not interested in the origins, so-called origins or centers of globalization. I'm interested only in the social change, dynamics of the social change and the slogan of globalization, which involves, of course, a significant power disparities as a matter of course. 
Uh, therefore, uh, based on the, uh, the above mentioned rough sketch, I started on inquiry into the history of the concept globalization in Japan. That is, uh, in which zone, what kind of actors, and how did they grasp the meaning of globalization? At the same time, I'm re uh, researching what kind of restructuring have happened along with the spread of the word globalization. Uh, the, pillar of this, uh, the pillars of this research are describing transborder mobilities and re uh, configuring, uh, configuring networks in and out of Japan since the 1990s uh, under the slogan of globalization. <coughs> uh, of course, uh, this research is a uh, partial and fragmented research on globalization. But I think this will make a small contribution to imagining the social and the age of globalization. <coughs> Through the uh, culminating of uh, such kind of researches in various spaces from uh, the viewpoint of hybridity, and uh, someday we may reach a condition where we can be talking about entangled and interconnected social lives or entangled history, we are both Eurocentrism and anti-Eurocentrism are dismissed more or less. <coughs> uh, from, a personal, uh, this is, uh, from a personal point of view, the ultimate purpose of this research or my research is to make a small contribution for imaging the social in the age of globalization. <coughs> And finally, uh, for the, doing this type of research, I believe that uh, Japanese studies are in a favorable position because the social life of people living in Japan has repeatedly experienced globalization and therefore uh, there are much empirical researches uh, that have referred to institutionalized globalization or hybridity. And in addition to this, there are many researchers who were well informed about the interaction between uh, the land and Japan. There are uh, many uh, Japanese, uh, there are uh, many researchers of Japanese studies uh, worldwide. And then where uh, they know about the interaction, uh, their own land and Japan. I hope that there are some researchers in Japanese studies who are interested in this kind of work and from this kind of view, uh, re-theorizing globalization and modernity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's all. Uh, this, uh, thank you for your attention. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Tsumi. Uh, I'm going, I'm now, I'm Toshimiak, I'm the last uh, speaker of our panel today. I'm going to try to share. My slides. Okay, let's see. Can you see the slides? Okay, so good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for joining our panel. Uh, I'm Toshio Miyake. I'm coming to from Kafoski University of Venice in Italy, where I teach society and cultural studies of contact with Japan at the Department of Asian and North African Studies. Uh, my apologies for some changes to the title to the context of my talk. Uh, they have been actually thought uh, two years ago and have undergone in the meanwhile some further elaboration. So the new title is From Strategic Orientalism to Hybrid and Pre-Reversal Japanese Studies, 
Japanization and New Japanese in contemporary Italy. Uh, now, let me first uh, start with the two main questions that are guiding my talk today. First, uh, how may we try overcoming or thinking the civilizational and identitarian cornerstone of modernity's iron cage, which among others have been built upon the Eurocentric othering of the so-called East, including Japan? And second, how are relations between wider academia and Japanese studies, as well as between academia, culture, and society changing within the present globalization globalization of Japan. Now, in order to address these questions, let me show the outline of my talk. First, I will touch on the so-called West and versus East Great Divide, configured by the ambivalent structure of Orientalism as intellectual oxymoron and its implication for area studies. And then I will address how we may try to unthink this modern civilizational and epistemic divide by referring to the colonial theory. Second, I will shift to the specific situation in contemporary Italy, which is the place where I'm part of the local Japanese studies feed by addressing what I call neo-Japanese strategic orientalism and subcultural mainstream. And finally, I will consider potential changes triggered by an increasing Japanization of Italian society and culture, which may possibly offer more convenient spaces for what I call tentatively as hybrid and pluriversal Japanese studies. Now, let me start by suggesting that the critical perspective, which may have strongly influenced our field of area studies at large for revisiting the epistemological self-evidence of Euro-American modernity and its supposed universal knowledge comes arguably from its very existence, from its, uh, our very own history of so-called Oriental studies in combination with the radical critique of its very existence coming from post-colonial studies. I argue that it is paradoxically the very wider historical notion of Orientalism that best exemplifies an intrinsic, ambivalent, and apparently contradictory tension towards both overcoming and being overcome by modernity, which is actually also the title of our panel. So on the one hand, we may consider Orientalism in its conventional meaning as a historical interest or passion in Europe and North America, starting roughly from the 19th century for the so-called Orient or the so-called East, this includes the very tension or even desire for exploring and understanding the Orient as both the historical, linguistic, or religious origin of the so-called West, as well as the geocultural space of alternative civilizations, religions, arts, literatures, lifestyles, and so forth, in respect to one's own civilizational identity, modernity, and its iron cage, such as rationalization, industrialization, capitalism, individualism, urban alienation, and so forth. In other words, Orientalism not only as a mere exoticism, but also as an intellectual, artistic, or existential tension to discover another with the capital letters, another to the so-called present West, and in some cases to find inspirations for overcoming the limits of its modernity. On the other hand, this very tension to discover and define the Orient or the East has been critically connected to an imperial or colonial discourse building and producing at the same time asymmetrical and Eurocentric relations of power. Most notably, Edward Said's post-colonial critique has shown how geopolitical and geocultural forces do intersect in new American political, intellectual, artistic, and academic fields in order to essentialize and reify the so-called East as a subaltern other, an oriental other defined by tradition, particularism, rationality, etc in binary opposition to the so-called West, defined instead by modernity, universalism, rationality, and so forth. In my view, while I largely subscribe to Said's critical perspective by using the term rentalism as intellectual oxymoron, I suggest that it is in this ambivalent and contradictory tension that we may find one of area studies past and possible future potential. A genuine interest to question and even overcome the limits of Eurocentric modernity while possibly or hopefully including a critical or reflexive perspective in order to not be overcome by Euro-American modernity. Now, besides my personal wish for thinking, it may be also crucial to consider the global intellectual division of academic labor, which has contributed to shape the very positionality of area studies. For instance, Sakai Naoki, by referring to post-war use academic and area studies, has pointed interesting to the distinction between humanitas and anthropos, 
which reproduces the modern great or orientalistic divide. According to Sakai, humanitas is the domain of the wider hegemonic fields of the humanities and social sciences. These fields are characterized by monodisciplinarity, identified as Western and as universal. They create theory in order to produce normative and explanatory knowledge of humankind, and they are conveyed mainly in English. While anthropos is the domain of every studies, characterized by interdisciplinarity or even absence of disciplinarity, by particularistic derivative or descriptive knowledge. This is a knowledge which is explained through the application of universal theory produced by the humanitas domain, and furthermore is conveyed by national languages. In other words, it seems that besides different intentions of single scholars, it is a modern and institutionalized configuration of the academic apparatus that has contributed to produce the dualism of a universalistic oriented academic center in the Anglophone world, in contrast to a multiplication of the particularistic oriented academic periphery of area studies. Center and periphery mutually and jointly enforce each other or actually need each other uh, for the production of their very existence, recognition and legitimacy. Furthermore, this is also the reason why, in my view, we still have to tackle, especially within area studies, with essentializing methodologies, such as methodological nationalism, the verification of anti, uh, sorry, uh, methodological, methodological nationalism, that is the verification of national characters, such as Japan, methodological regionalism, the verification of anti regions or continents, such as Asia, and especially methodological civilizationalism, the verification, fetishism, or hypostatization of civilizations such as the so-called West or the so-called East, which are all abstractions but treated as discrete, separate, and uniform entities or even subjects having material and concrete existence and acquiring a kind of hyper-reality. So the issue at this point resonates to a certain extent with what Professor A.J. Oguma has already addressed during his keynote lecture on Tuesday. What can Japanese studies contribute to the world? Or put it in other words, how can theory and concepts elaborated in and about Japan, such as that of Minzoku explained by Professor Oguma, contribute to the understanding of contexts outside Japan? However, as the very concept of Minzoku and its relation to the concept of race as a resistance implies, I would strongly argue that it is the double or ambivalent structure of coloniality that has to be underlined in the case of modern and contemporary Japan. The modern nation state Japan has been both an active imperialist colonizer towards its internal minorities in Hokkaido and the Ryukyu archipelago and towards its external neighbors such as in Formosa, the Korean Peninsula and mainland China. But at the same time, modern Japan has developed a kind of reactive or defensive discourse of victimhood or subalternity towards the so-called hegemonic West, especially towards the US during and after the occupation. This ambivalent structure of asymmetrical power relations rooted in modern coloniality means that the challenge from a critical perspective is to avoid limiting to enhance or sustain theory or concepts elaborated in Japan only in order to explain regions, people, or knowledge outside Japan, especially if they have been subaltern objects of colonial Japanization. This would risk reproducing more than an iron cage of universal knowledge created by a hegemonic or imperialist colonial actor in order to explain subaltern or particularistic peripheries. So the even more crucial challenge for Japanese studies would be instead to elaborate or enhance theory concepts from Japan in order to explain the hegemonic Euro-American context, to think about a different kind of Japanization, which would possibly contribute, hopefully, to a more decentered, diverse, and hybrid kind of knowledge. Anyway, regardless of colonial Japanization in Asia or Japanization of Euro-American context, my point with a reference to Japanization is that we will, if we want to address the issue of modernity and coloniality, as well as the challenge of unthinking Eurocentric modernity in relation to Japanese studies, we need to take into account not only the abstract or speculative aspects of theories and concepts. That is, we may need to take into account Japanization as a concrete material or political, economical, social, cultural expansion, expansion of Japan outside its national boundaries and its entanglements within global internet, 
interconnections in modern and contemporary times. For this reason, I would like to refer to some critical concepts of decolonial theory, which have been elaborated originally in the last decades in the Latin American context. These regions, countries, and populations share historically quite similar double or ambivalent structure as modern Japan. They have been to a certain degree subaltern to hegemonic centers such as the US or Europe, but they are also hegemonic nation states who have colonized internally their native populations. One of these concepts is border thinking. It refers to the challenge to radically question the epistemic foundations of modern Euro-American universal knowledge and its colonial legacy in order to find spaces for different epistemological alternatives. However, it is not an ideal or romantic outside space in respect to Euro-American universal or colonial epistemology that these alternatives have to be pursued, such as was the case in classical Orientalism and cultural anthropology, but within the very iron cage of modernity and its present globalization by locating in a reflexive way the interconnected, entangled, marginal positionalities of those of these possible alternatives towards hegemonic center or hegemonic centers. The other related concept is pluriverse. It is aimed at fostering epistemological diversity, but is different from abstract pluralism, cultural relativism, or multiculturalism, usually sustained by mainstream neoliberalism. Pluriversal knowledge and practice builds instead on the assumption of the colonial board of thinking about the specific located positions and diversified asymmetric relations of power. I quote from Walter Mignolo, if the pluriverse is not a world of independent units, as in the case with cultural relativism, but a world entangled through and by the colonial matrix of power, then a way of thinking and understanding that the worlds in the interstices of the entanglement at its borders is needed. So the, so the point is not to study the borders while still dwelling in a territorial epistemology you are comfortable with. Such an approach would imply that you accept that there is a pluriverse someplace out there, but that you observe it from someplace else, somewhere outside the pluriverse." End of quote. However, the concept of pluriversal knowledge is not only related to the complex or ambivalent matrix of colonial power, but has been further elaborated with the global and intersectional differentiation according to race, ethnicity, class, gender, disability, and so forth, which should be all considered as interconnected, intertwined, or entangled, configuring specific kind of hegemonic, subaltern, and possible alternative epistemologies and practices. So having these issues in mind, I would like to shift to my second part of my talk. It will address the example of a specific location, in my case, contemporary Italy, where I'm working since the last 20 years. Therefore, I will refer to a different kind of Japanization, that is to say, Japanization of a non-colonized Euro-American context and its diversified relations to Japanese studies. Now, Japanization of contemporary Italy is strongly connected to, to neo-Japanism, which has been actually a global phenomenon since the last decades of the 20th century. In the context of Italy, contemporary new Japanism is distinctive to past or modern Japanese, both for specific social relations and its diffusion. The modern attraction for Japan in the late 19th and early 20th century can be considered as a wider European fashion from above, which means mainly fostered by aristocracy and bourgeois social classes in visual, decorative, literary, performative arts based on the elitist or orientalist fascination with traditional Japanese culture what has been sometimes invented as traditional Japanese culture, such as ukiyo-e, haiku, tea ceremony, geisha, bushido, and etc., etc. While with neo-Japanese, I'm referring to the more widespread attraction to Japan since the 1990s from below, which means middle classes and youth inspired by products of Japanese cultural industry, stimulating fascination for manga, anime, video games, food design, fashion, and so forth. While modern Japanese continues to be reproduced in order to confer cultural elitist legitimacy to the, or, uh, to the attraction to Japan, neo-Japanism has reached the level of mass enculturation or mass acculturation of younger generations. The anime boom starting in the late 1970s has probably had probably the most crucial role. According to Marco Pelletari, the extensive liberalization and proliferation of hundreds of private and local TV stations in the 
70s has brought to morning and afternoon programs filled with cheap, attractive, as well as uncontrolled media contents, including, including adult-oriented anime with extreme violence and sexual explicit contents. This has brought in Italy to a world record of anime series broadcast on TV outside Japan, as well as subsequently to the European record of manga titles translated to Italian. It means that at present, a large part of under 50 years old population has been enculturated since early childhood through the so-called J-culture media mix, anime, manga, video games, character groups, and so forth. Now, new Japanese had its effects also on the academic side. An explosion of students' enrollment and of scholars in the field of Japanese studies. I myself have uh, been enrolled in the 1990s as a student of Japanese studies at Kafosuke University of Venice. At the time, there were only, I think, four universities offering a specialization in Japanese studies. Since then, the number has increased at least to 10 universities. Now, if we look only at Kafosuke University, the number of students and teachers has more than tripled in the last 25 years, becoming, thanks also to Chinese, Korean, Southeast Asian studies program, the largest center of Asian studies in Italy. At present, we have about 1,500 students specializing in a BA, MA, or PhD program of Japanese studies, assisted, assisted by 34 teaching staff. However, this does not mean that we are teaching subjects such as popular cultures or media, related to the very reason why most of our students have decided to specialize in Japanese studies. I would argue that quite the opposite is the case because we're still focusing mainly on traditional or pre-modern scholarship of Japan, especially in the fields of the humanities such as literature, religions, visual arts, theater, philology, and so forth, continuing as in the past to focus to a large extent to the particularistic uniqueness of Japanese language and culture. And I would also argue that, it, that this is quite surprisingly what most of our students are expecting, a so-called deep elitist um, and possibly uh, aesthetic understanding of Japan. This means that cultural exceptionalism of traditional or high co culture configured in a rentalistic fashion as something completely different from the so-called hyperreality of the West is still a highly attractive cultural capital to be gained by specializing in Japanese studies. Now, I consider the structure enabling this specific encounter between the academic field of Japanese studies and the social context of Japan lovers as a mutually enforcing encounter between strategic orientalism from above by Japanologists and subcultural mainstream from below by Nipponophiles. On the one hand, if you look at Neo-Japanese in the last decade, you can observe how fans of anime, manga, or cosplay have shifted from being a subcultural minority to become gradually a subcultural mainstream. In this process, the new Nipponophiles have created a dualistic and polarized structure in order to define the object of attraction. First, love for anime or manga considers something completely different opposite and exclusively unique compared to the so-called Western Walt Disney animation or Marvel comics. Second, anime and manga have been considered as victimized objects of moral panic by adult generations or of censorship by major TV broadcasting stations who have been widely criticized for not being able to understand the supposed pure, authentic, intrinsic essence of the original based on a deep and unique traditional Japanese culture. And third, more recently, we observe the proliferation of exclusivist and self-referential digital communities who differentiate themselves and struggle for subcultural capital versus non-nipponophiles, versus nipponophiles not interested in manga and anime, versus so-called superficial, superficial or ignorant manga and anime fandom, and so forth. On the other hand, if we look at neo-Japanese from above in the academic field of Japanese studies, you can still see an avoidance to research or teach Japanese popular media and cultures because considered not as real or valuable or deep Japan. But most importantly, cultural civilizational essentialism is still common in order to claim epistemological privilege and especially linguistic exclusivism on Japan. I consider this kind of neo-rentalism as a kind of survival strategy for courses, departments, or faculties of Asian or Avro studies within neoliberal reform in order to avoid absorption by stronger monodisciplinary departments or faculties. 
It offers the competitive value added research, a cultural capital or distinction in terms of identity recognition as Japanese studies and legitimacy. However, I argue that it is this very self-proclaimed or assigned status of Japanologists as super experts of Japan that contributes to active self-confinement and marginalization, both in respect to hegemonic academic fields and public opinion. Japanologists still continue to a large extent, as in the past, to be translators and experts of particularistic knowledge of Japan, while having very little to say about the Italian, European, or global context. However, if you try to look outside the core of new Japanese, shaped by Nipponophiles and Japanologists, you can see a larger picture of Japanization cross-cutting many fields of the economy, society, media, and culture and contemporary Japan. And I would argue that it is, in, it is from this wider perspective that we can already see how knowledge about Japan has contributed to change Italy in many fields, even if largely ignored by specialized scholarship of Japanese studies, at least in Italy. For instance, in the field of economy and business, the global success of Japanese car industry in the 1980s and of Toyota in particular has brought to the concept of Toyotism as a competitive mode of post fordist lean manufacture production, introducing a large number of business courses about Kaizen, where Japanese experts have come and are still coming a large number to teach how to improve production and business in Italian factories. In the field of architecture, we have an increasing number of Italian architects who are including Japanese styles in order to plan urban landscapes, design buildings, and interior design. Or we have high profile Japanese architects who are coming regularly to Italy, as for example, Tadao Ando, who may be the most influential contemporary architect shaping the very small spaces of architectural changes concedes to the historical center of Venice. Furthermore, it is not only economically competitive or exceptional cultural products or styles imported for Japan that are contributing to change contemporary Italy, but may be more interesting, at least from a sociological point of view, this contemporary Japan, Japanese society itself as a kind of laboratory of intense high modernity, urbanization, consumerism that offers many examples of global phenomena that are shared and diffused also in Italy. For instance, the hikikomori phenomena is widely studied by Italian psychologists because in Italy too, we see an increasing number of young people entering social withdrawal or seclusion. And I think there could be many other examples of this kind. So to conclude the building of the Italian context, I would argue first that Japanization is a wider global process which already has activated very different dynamics of hybridization where objects, practices, styles, knowledge, and even persons from Japan are included, mixed and even changed in order to become an integral part of the Italian context contributing to its ongoing transformation. Second, this means that the great modern divide of the iron cage between a universal West and a particularistic, unique, and exceptional Japan may be more a discursive product shaped by new Japanese through what I've called the encounter between strategic orientalism within Japanese studies and subcultural mainstream within Nipponophiles, young and old. Third, if you want to imagine how Japanese studies may, at least in the Italian context, try to overcome or unthink, unthink the self-secluding and self-marginalizing legacies of modern orientalism then we may need from a scholarly point of view, not only to understand the epistemological limits of modernity, as has been discussed before by Matteo and also by Utsumi, we may have to address also its effects from a methodological point of view, such as methodological civilizationalism, for instance, the ongoing hypostatization or what I call discursive fetishism of what we call the West, and of course, methodological nationalism. It is building on these assumptions that it becomes possible to address the crucial aspect of hybridity, which is not only a recent phenomena, but as, as Utsumi-san has already shown before, an intrinsic aspect of modernity at large in the last centuries. This means, among others, that Japanologists may need not only more epistemological and methodological awareness, but also more specialized or even monodisciplinary knowledge about both the specific national or regional context where they're working as well as about the global situation in general. In other words, we may urgently need to exit the academic comfort zone that Japanese studies has become for many of us. 
And finally, on one hand, the previous indication on epistemological, methodological, and disciplinary retention may sound quite common sense for the humanities and social sciences. However, on the other, I would argue also that one specific distinction or maybe even historical privilege of every studies, such as Japanese studies, may be its potential to be more critically or reflexively aware of the intercultural process of mediating different regional, national, and cultural contexts. This means that it is the very relational aspect of our scholarship that should offer an advantage perspective. It includes hopefully the critical understanding of the asymmetrical relations of power, both between our located positionality in Europe and the Japanese context, as well as differentiation within Japan that do not magically disappear even if we tackle past or present globalization or hybridity in order to eventually universalize particularistic knowledge about Japan. So by using the term pluriversal Japanese studies and referring not only to the decolonial theory of border thinking in order to delink the ambivalent matrix of modernity coloniality in Japan, in Italy or between Italy and Japan, but in addition and referring also to intersectional awareness according to the located and relational positionalities shaped by race, ethnicity, class, gender and so forth and configuring case by case specific kind of hegemon, subaltern, and possible alternative epistemologies and practices regarding Japan. In other words, the issue would not only be how generalized, abstract, and depersonalized Japanese studies scholarship can contribute to the world, but in addition, also the introduction of a more reflexive and relational perspective. For instance, who is actually doing Japanese studies? From what kind of contingent location or positionality and how is this positionality both shaped and shaping specific social relations between Japanese and non-Japanese contexts, as well as within Japan? Okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, now we can shift to the questions part of the session. Unfortunately, and my deepest apologies, uh, due to some overlong talk, including my talk, we may not have enough time to take all questions. So if this should happen, we'd be all very happy, Utsumi and Mateo and me, if you would send your questions directly to us at the email addresses that you can see on the slide. So please, who would like to start? Um, I'm sorry, Toshio. Uh, I think that um, uh, Margot is telling us that uh, if we have not enough time, we can also use a different platform in order to continue our discussions. Okay. And she has uh, uh, provided us it at, uh, at the chat. So it, it could be quite interesting if someone wants to continue this. Okay. Uh, if I may, I would like to start with a question to to Professor Miyake, uh, which is which is a very uh, well uh, easy question to 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 start with, but a very difficult question to answer too, and which is uh, I I am I was very um, impressed by the idea of exiting the academic comfort zone in uh, Japanese studies you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so my idea, my, uh, my question is uh, the following. Uh, concretely, how does this mean in, uh, in our everyday academic life? How is it possible to do this exit in outside of Comfort zone. I mean, it's quite difficult I'm, uh, for many of many academics uh, to rethink oneself uh, in the moment they have their own careers, they have their own uh, ways of thinking at things, and maybe in these uh, 
uh, things, uh, for example, manga or anime have been a kind of uh, something that was done uh, many years ago and now they have just changed. So what do you think about it? Yes, thank you. I have problems actually with my with my Zoom. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So yes, uh, quite a complex uh, question. Of course, uh, as we all know, uh, Italian academic uh, world is strongly conditioned by what we call scientific disciplinary dis disciplines. So we do our career within well-defined boundaries. And so we have area studies and within area studies with language and uh, Japanese literature or Japanese religion. And if you exit from then uh, your publications and, and, and shift in other discipline, uh, you do actually do not have a career. It will be very, very difficult. So we have this kind of institutional framework. Uh, so this means, for example, if you speak about manga and anime, you don't have an academic career in Japan, in Italy, if you study manga and anime, uh, as you know. So uh, uh, you have the institutional framework, but uh, I, I don't think that institutional framework is all that uh, uh, encompasses our activity. So it, uh, it depends also if you want to exit from this Iron cage, or if it's a comfort zone, it depends. An iron cage can be very comfortable. And so I was uh, insisting on this because I think most of us uh, are very comfortable because you're protected, you are the super expert, you have your niche. Nobody is going to criticize you because you are the super expert of your very small field, you read Japanese language and, and so on. Uh, so um, the issue is also, at least for me, and I think also for you and Otsumi, uh, who is a newcomer in Japanese studies, um, of course, uh, how we can think different ways and how, if I may use the word of hybridity, how we may be hybrid while being within our area studies uh, uh, frame, because if we want to do work, if we want to work in Italian uh, institutions, this is for necessary, but also how to approach different scholars. So that's what, what we are doing, of course. Yes. 